We're so honored. We're so honored to be here tonight. You may be seeking the presence of the Lord. So, so, we're so honored to be here tonight that you. It's always a uh, uh, pleasure. It's always a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure and privilege to come and share the Kingdom Church and just be a part. I was here a couple weeks ago for the uh, William Murphy concert. It was absolutely awesome. Amen. Absolutely awesome. And, and um, uh, it's so good to uh, come and experience this beautiful sanctuary. Uh, you ought to give God praise for that. Amen. And uh, every time I come and teach, I'm always amazed and I'm welcome back. I say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Of early 
African Christianity, we have to look at the, the Nile Delta. And of course, the Nile Delta is a single ecological system that stretches as far as Uganda to the Congo, to the Egyptian Delta. It's the world's largest river, and it stretches 4,160 miles from south to north. And much of, believe it or not, much of Christian intellectual history developed in the valleys and cities of the Nile Delta. It is the seabed of early African, early Christian thought, not just African Christian thought, early Christian thought. I don't know how well you can see that map um, that's on the next slide, but um, I tried to give you, oh, it's very good. Um, the blue line is the Nile River. So you see, um, it goes as far, and this is a modern map of, of um, Africa. We will look at a, a pre, what I would call a pre enlightenment map of, of um, Africa in a few, but this is a modern map of Africa. You see how far the Nile goes from um, as far north as Egypt to as far south as Tanzania. And so, if you're going to talk about um, African. African origin of Christianity, we have to look at the biblical table of nations that we find in Genesis chapter 10. Now, um, we don't have a lot of time just being reading scripture, but we will identify what scripture is important. And Genesis 10 is, is the major starting point for the identification of ancient African nations that had a relationship with ancient Israel. Nations that are listed in this list in Genesis 10 are Cush, Put, Canaan, Egypt, and Sheba. And if you look at verses 8 through 14 specifically, it suggests that Egypt, Cush, and Canaan held major influence over the Asia Minor, the Mediterranean, and over Africa. And so there are other nations that are also identified in Scripture which are African nations, Ethiopia and Cyrene are moving pretty fast. Here. But I want to take some time to kind of identify some where we see African presence in Scripture. Um, in Genesis 10, we're introduced to a person by the name of Nimrod, who was a Kushite, Kush in Africa, and is considered the founder of civilization in Mesopotamia, in the Mesopotamia region. Um, how many of us are familiar with Abraham? Abraham is from a place called Ur. Some of the earliest inhabitants of Ur were people of black skin, particularly the, the Sumerians, who are known as black-haired ones. But it's not just talking about the hair on their head, it's talking about the color of their skin. So some of the earliest inhabitants of the place where Abraham originated from were black people, or people of black skin. Of course, we're very familiar with Hagar, right? And for some reason, Hagar gets a bad name. She's probably the most innocent person in the text. I might get in trouble for that, but it's true. She's the Egyptian slave of Abraham and Sarah. If you look in Genesis chapter 15, who did them a big favor and had a baby, and then they put her out. <clears throat> now, this will sound a little crazy, but it's true. Do you realize that having Hagar, an Egyptian woman, as their slave, it increased their status? Because at the time, the people of Egypt were the wealthy people. So to have an Egyptian slave increases your status. So you're supposed to be the oppressed, but you have a slave from the race of quote unquote oppressors, so to speak. So actually, Hagar increases um, Sarah and Abram's status. We also see in Genesis 14 that Joseph was married to an Egyptian woman. We're told in Numbers chapter 12 that Moses was married to a Cushite woman, an African woman. We're told in 1 Kings chapter 10, we're told of the story of when King Sheba um, encounters Solomon. And we know that. What is the one thing Solomon asked God for? Wisdom. And guess how he knew he had wisdom? 
He knew because Queen Sheba validated the fact that he had wisdom through what is called African real wisdom. If you go back and read that chapter, you will see that she asked him a series of rhetorical questions. Now what does that mean? That means she already knew the answer to the questions. She wanted to know if he knew the answers to the questions. And of course he knew the answers, but the point here is that Africa, not only is it the cradle of civilization, there is scientific, archaeological evidence to prove that humankind um, originated in Africa. It is also uh, the place where literature was formed, mathematics was formed. How many of you are familiar with Plato? Do you know Plato studied in Africa, in Alexandria, which is not in Greece, it's in Africa, North Africa. He studied in Alexandria and went back to Europe and wrote Plato from the Republic. How many of you are familiar with Pythagoras, who formed the Pythagorean theorem? Studied in Africa, they went back to Europe and became the father of mathematics. So Africa is not only the birthplace of humanity, it's also the cradle of civilization. It's also the place where we get rhetoric from, where we get mathematics from. And so uh, the Queen of Sheba was a very educated sister, was a wise sister, and she was the person God used to validate the fact that Solomon had wisdom, an African woman. You remember in Matthew 2, in Matthew the second chapter, uh, when King Herod uh, puts out a decree to kill all of the infant Hebrew infant children. And what does Jesus' mother do, like a good mother would do? They get out of town, right? Where do they go? They go to Egypt. Now, if you're trying to hide out from somebody, you're not going to go among folk that don't look like you. Can I just be real with y'all? If I'm trying to have an OBD, I'm not going to window <laughs> I'm going to Pine Hills, the Paramore, Harbor Shores, Malibu. Somebody know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> We see Jesus going to Egypt. Egypt is in Africa to hide out from Herod. Then we see after Jesus um, has been crucified, a lot he's been crucified actually, his cross is carried by Simon of Serene, who is an African because Serene is in Africa. Then in Acts chapter 8, after the day of Pentecost, we see the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, which is Richard's really, he's probably the first Ethiopian uh, con convert, person to come to Christianity, which means e Ethiop Christianity came to Ethiopia in the first century. So, so these are biblical references, okay? We're not making this up. But there have been attempts let me check my time. There have been attempts to minimize the African influence on the biblical text. You say, how? First, through maps. Maps that were developed after the Enlightenment period. The Enlightenment period was a period that occurred in the 18th century. Have omitted, have, have attempted to omit many of the African nations, such as Kush, Put, and Sarin, from the African continent. Some maps have located Kush and Ethiopia outside of Africa, especially as it relates to the Garden of Eden. Because some folks don't want us to know that the Garden of Eden is actually in Africa. Let me say this, it might get me in trouble, but I'm saying there is no such thing as the Middle East. That's a political designation. There's not a such thing as the Middle East. The countries that we know that are in the Middle East, they are either part of North Africa or the southern part of Asia. There is no such thing as the Middle East. Um, so 
Israel is not in the Middle East. Some have even attempted to move Egypt out of Africa by making a distinction between sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt. And they even convinced some Egyptians that they're not African. Some have argued that the descendants, we'll talk more about this later, that the descendants of Ham were not Africans. And what that does is that, that then suggests that there's not an African presence in the Bible at all. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you ever read your Bible and you saw Cush? You've seen Egypt. You've seen Ethiopia, right? How many times have you seen England? How many times have you seen France? I'm just curious. Now, if you go look at Paul's missionary journeys, I think you see Spain. You may see Italy, maybe, possibly. But, uh, but predominantly, if you look both in the Old and New Testament, particularly the Old Testament, you're going to see African nations. Um, there's also this notion that Christianity was imported into Africa from the West or the North. That's a false notion. And this, this misconception suggests that Christian intellectual leadership moved from Europe to Africa. That is not true. It's the other way around. Christian leadership flowed from Africa to you. That's going to make sense in a minute. Now here, um, next, I want to show you the difference in a map pre-enlightenment period of Africa and a map of Africa post-enlightenment period. This is a pre-enlightenment period map of Africa. Now, I don't know if you can clearly see what's written. It's in Latin, by the way, so that might that might be a challenge as well. It is for me. I don't know about you. But um, I know it's not really clear. But on this particular map, you see countries that you wouldn't see on the modern day map of Africa. Like Alexandria. Like Cuba, Like Cartage. Like Nubia. These are countries. Now, it's, it's partly because of, again, the Enlightenment period. Because of... Um, um, colonialism because of imperialism where countries have come and invaded the African continent and taken over and renamed the, continent, the countries where they wanted to rename them. That's part of the problem. But there's also an agenda here. And the agenda is the same agenda that the Portuguese had and other European nations had when they enslaved Africans and didn't want them to know their names in the Bible so they called them Negroes. Because the Negro in Spanish means what? Is uh, the next slide is the current map. This is what we know today is Africa. You see any differences? A lot of differences, right? A lot of differences. So, uh, as I spoke of earlier, uh, Biblical archaeologists argue that the oldest Bible and most uh, many Jews lived there for about two to three centuries prior to even Judaism or Christianity formed. Um, well, the coming of Christianity. African Jews were present. Yes, I said African Jews. Now, please do not mistake that for the black Hebrew folk we're going to talk about later. African Jews were present in ancient North Africa, including places like Ethiopia and Egypt. And these ancient Africans, what made them African Jews was because they practiced Judaism. Not that they were necessarily born Jewish, but they practiced Judaism. Anybody remember Simon, Simon James Jr.? He would be an African Jew. All right. So, of course, we're familiar with the um, Pentecost, right? What occurs in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And we know that this constitutes the birth of the Christian church. Among the 120 
that we, that we read about in Acts chapter 1, who were in the other room, there were actually Africans, uh, African Jews, who were in that mix. There were also Greek-speaking Jews of Egypt and Cyrene who were present at Pentecost. And we don't have time to read it. But you all remember these folks, the spirit of these they began speaking in tongues. And now we often say, uh, my Pentecostal friend, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but there we are, right? I need to come out here to say this. We often talk about unknown tongues in Acts chapter 2. If I can do a little Bible study, teach that already right past uh, But really what you see in Acts chapter 2 is other, what I would call other tongues. What you see in Acts chapter 2 is zonalalia. You say, well, Pastor, what is zonalalia? Zonalalia is to speak in a foreign language that you don't know, but you speak it. Glossalalia is to speak in an unknown tongue, which could be a foreign language, but it's still an unknown tongue. There is a difference, though, because zonalalia are tongues that are used to evangelize foreigners. So if you look at Acts chapter 2, when these 120 began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them others, these folk that are listed, some of them are African, not just African, you have some Asians, you got some other folk, they said these people must be drunk because they are speaking in our languages and they've never learned our languages, so they must be drunk. So among those folk who say these other 120 must be drunk are some Africans, some Egyptians, some, some Cyrenians saying, something wrong with these folk. Uh, they don't lost their mind because they speak in our language. They don't even know our language. But when Paul talks about tongues in Corinthians, he's talking about glossolalia. But in Acts, what you see is zonolalia. Like I said, I get in trouble, but that's all right. So, um, Afri early Christianity, is a part of traditional African religion. Most of us have probably heard that the slaves were, did not know about Christianity until they came to America. That is not true. That is not true. Do you know that the old, one of the oldest Christian churches is the Ethiopian Coptic Church? and the Egyptian Orthodox Church. Those are two of the oldest Christian churches in the world. And the Coptic Christians of Egypt claim that Mark, Saint Mark, who is credited for writing the oldest gospel, was the first apostle to Egypt, was the first to come to Egypt and preach the gospel in 64 AD. In 64 AD. So Mark, is historically identified as the founder of the Egyptian Coptic Church. And to, traditionally, Mark has been identified as a Jew. But what we don't hear is that Mark is actually an African Jew. A, a Cyrenian Jew. And he's martyred. And to be martyred is to be what? It means to die for what you believe in. He's martyred in Alexandria, which we're going to talk about in a few. So Alexandria, which we'll talk about now actually, Alexandria was the largest city of the ancient world. Alexandria was the main connecting point between the Nile Delta and the rest of the world. And Alexandria is in North Africa. The library in Alexandria was the foundation, the foundation and the incubator for Euro the European University. In other words, Europeans developed universities based on what they learned in Alexandria, in Africa. The city of Alexandria in Egypt became a great center of early Christianity. Now, this is very important and uh, uh, because we, we don't learn this stuff and we really do need to know this. Because this is really the enlightenment 
is really where we get this notion that Christianity is a white man's religion and that we serve a white, blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. This is really where it comes from. You say, what is the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment was a philosophical movement in the 18th century uh, that prioritized rational thought, reason over faith, and, and also promoted what we would call a scientific revolution. Um, and, but what occurs during the Enlightenment period theologically is what I would call the problem of theological whiteness in modern theology. There was an Enlightenment thinker by the name of Immanuel Kant, and Kant equated whiteness with perfection, which was the development of what we in theological circles call Christian supersessionism. Let me say, what is that? Christian supersessionism is the theory that calls um, some European Christians to racialize Jesus and replace Jews in the covenant with the white Christian church. All right. Now, why is that important to what we're talking about? It's important because this became the, in, the impetus for, for some persons who practice white supremacy and white superiority in Christianity. I'm not going to say no names, I'm tempted, but I'm not going to do it. And, the, and this erroneous idea that Christianity is a white man's religion, and that is so far from the truth. And that's how the black Hebrews get folk to join that group, because they convince people that Christianity is a white man's religion. Also, the nation of Islam, the reason they're able to get so many black men in prison is because they convince them that Christianity is a white man's religion, and it is not. Post-Enlightenment systematic theories of race and racism have been affirmed and strengthened by Eurocentric biblical scholars who ignore ancient black culture and that is reflected in the biblical text. So, let me give you a good example. One of the major examples. Look at Genesis chapter 9. Read when you get home. You see what has been, what has, what has been developed as the curse of Ham ideology. You say, what is that? Well, people of African descent we have traditionally been identified as descendants of Ham. You know, you know your Bible. Ham was the son of Noah. And Ham was the son that looked on Noah's nakedness. Now, the myth, I'm calling it a myth for a reason. The myth that we have believed based on our interpretation of the text is that Noah cursed Ham. In actuality, Noah did not curse Ham. Noah cursed Canaan. Go back and read your scriptures. It wasn't him that he cursed. He cursed Cana. Now, granted, Cana is an African descendant of Ham. But Cana is not the only African descendant of Adam, which is blacks are not descendants of Adam. Now, keep in mind, these Views develop after the Enlightenment. Remember, I told you what develops during the Enlightenment is, is Emmanuel Kant and others equate whiteness with perfection. So anything that's not white is not perfect, it's not good. And blackness becomes a sign of a curse. So there's an old Hamite view which says Ham was turned black as a result of Noah's curse. And his descendants were doomed to bear the same color. A black an African theologian put a name to it. Clement Alexander, who believed that faith and reason complements one another. Uh, he's considered the father of systematic theology. Now, if you've ever been to seminary, that is, that is one of that is one of the main courses you're gonna take is systematic theology. And generally is, is unfortunately it's taught from a strictly Eurocentric viewpoint. So people never learned that actually the father of systematic theology was an African man by the name of Origi. McClendon. I mean, Origi of Alexandria was born in Alexandria at North Africa. And he was a student of Clement. 
And he was really the person who, now this is going to really get me in trouble, Pastor David will give you later. If you look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, uh, you really look at it a few things. I don't want to get too much because I'll get in trouble. But we generally see that as the creation narrative, right? That tells us about how we were, how creation came into existence, right? Well, Origen argues that the first chapter is the spiritual creation. It gives you the sophisticated version of creation. He argues that the second chapter is the physical story. It gives you the less sophisticated one. So, this is an African theologian uh, who really becomes a heavyweight in what we know as the study of hermeneutics and the study of interpretation and his interpretation of the Bible. Now, I got to move. This guy is very important. Athanasius of Alexandria. If it was not for Athanasius, we would not have the robust Christology we have. In other words, we really wouldn't understand that the Father and the Son are co-equal and co-eternal. That, that God the Father and Jesus the Son are of the same substance. Jesus is not of a lesser substance. Jesus is not so, is, is well, I don't, some would argue that Jesus is subordinate to the Father. But if you look at the Trinity, they are all co-equal and co-eternal. Three persons in one. And it is Athanasius uh, who becomes a strong defender of what we know as Orthodox Christianity against the Arian controversy. And let me explain what Arianism is. It's what the folk that knock on your door on Saturday morning called the Jehovah's Witness trying to convince you of. And they don't mock my house. They don't come to my house. They go to everybody else's house. And my wife always get me. And I say, well, they knock on my door. So, so they want to leave. And I'm I said, no, you knock on my door. I'm in my pajamas. I got in my bed. Let's talk. You get your Bible, I'm going to get mine. And they will try to convince you that they're reading from the same scriptures, but they are not. They use the New World Translation. And if all you got to do is take them to John 1 and 1. And John 1 and 1, and, and our text says, well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, right? What? In the New World Translation, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God, and God is a Lord, he's G. Wow. That's what you call Arianism. It was, it was, Arianism is based on that particular scripture, and what Arius argued was that Jesus is not born of God. Jesus is not begotten of God. Jesus was the first created being. Now, what's wrong with that? That makes Jesus just like me and you. And so after nations who was so black and so short, they called him the black dwarf. That's how black he was, the black dwarf, is short. So he comes up and he says, no, nah, bro, listen, you need, you, need, you need a reality check. Jesus the Son and God the Father are the same. They are the same substance. Jesus is born of the Father because Jesus is the Father. All right? So, Athanasius is very important. Then, Augustine. Anybody ever heard of Augustine? How many of y'all know Augustine was a black man? Augustine, uh, who is the primary architect of Catholic theology, was from North Africa. And, because my time is going out, Augustine is the person who was responsible. Anybody ever heard of original sin? What is it? Is what? What, what, when you say original sin, what, 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 what does that mean? Adam, what did Adam do to you? <laughs> he made all of humanity fall. Right? And so because of his sin, uh, because of his fall, it affected all of us. So 
Original sin is not the sin we commit, it's the condition we suffer from. Wow. Actual sin is the sin we actually commit, but we commit it because of the condition. Original sin is a disease on the inside of us. Yes. All right. And, and so Augustine, and I'm not going to, you can read this later. Uh, Augustine comes up with this big word called concupiscence. And he's really struggling with his own struggles as someone who has, who has lived a life full of sexual sin. All right? One who, if you ever read his, his autobiographical book, it's called The Confessions. And then he talks about his, his, his wild escapades with his concubines. And from that, he, he, he gathers that original sin occurred through through some type of sexual act, but I ain't got time to get into that. But just know that a, this doctrine of original sin comes from a black man. So our point here has, has the point I've really been trying to make is we have biblical evidence, we have historical evidence, and we have theological evidence um, to prove that there are African origins of Christianity, and Christianity is not a white man's religion. In fact, there's a book that you will see on this slide, um, written by a West End theologian by the name of Thomas Owen, and the name of the book is How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind. It's a good book, you should read it. So, um, I put that map up again because all of those cities that those theologians are from are Africans, are African cities. Alexandria, Hippo, Carthage, these are all African countries. Now that brings us, uh, and I also want to make a point, that through those theologians and others that I did not mention, we now understand that African Christianity has had, Africa has had a major influence in the crafting of of our understanding as Christians of sin and grace, creation and providence, atonement, eschatology, eschatology doesn't mean what's going to happen in the last days, um, baptism and the life of prayer. Africa has had a major impact on our understanding, but most of us don't know that because we were never taught that. So that's what Pastor David brought me here. <laughs> so I hope you're learning something. So now, before we conclude, let's just look at these, these black Hebrew folks before they, before they get you. You get them before they get you. First of all, they argue that the Trinity is a false teaching. Alright, we just got to talk about the Trinity, right? They would say that's false. Secondly, they would say that God's only true name is Yah. Yah. And what's so fascinating to me is that uh, if you look at the original language, it's really Jah, J H. But I won't go anywhere. <laughs> but, and they argue that the true name of the Messiah in the New Testament is that Yahshua ben Yah, Yahshua the son of Yah. Yahshua the Messiah was an Israelite, but he had no earthly father. So what made him an Israelite was he was born through the womb of an Israelite woman. This is what they believe. And salvation is only possible by calling on the true name of Jesus in Hebrew. So you can't say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You've got to call on the Hebrew name of Jesus. Which I don't even know. I guess I just said it, but... Okay. <laughs> um, um, they will also argue that hell is a metaphor, it's not a literal place. In fact, they will say there is no heaven or hell. They will say we're living in heaven right now on the earth, and it's a and it's a concave heaven. Wow. We're living in heaven right now. Lord Jesus. If this happened, help me over those. That's 
they say, we're living in a Caucasian heaven on earth. A white, white folk heaven on earth. And they say, black people, we are the true Israelites from the tribe of Judah. I guess we're the chosen folk. And they use Lamentations 5 verse 10 to prove this, which describes Israelites as those whose skin are as black as an oven. Wow. They also argue that Hispanics, Native Americans, and Negroes are the real Israelites. The Jews are the Negroes in America. Uh, the 12 tribes of Israel are divided up into various ethnic groups among the Hispanics, Native Americans, and Negroes. White people are seen as conspirators who attempt to persecute the black people and hide their true identity as Israelites. People on this earth are the, in the Caucasian heaven right now since white people are dominating this world and subjugating black people. When the Messiah returns, the Hebrew Jesus, all Israel, meaning all black folk, will be gathered back to the promised land near the Israel, present day Israel. So, what are their practices? Well, you know the first one. They, they gather on street corners <laughs> in major cities and condemn people for their allegedly false beliefs. So if you're a Christian, your beliefs are false. I've been told that by my they keep the Jewish Sabbath and many other Jewish customs such as circumcision, dietary laws, and observance of certain Jewish holidays and festivals. They use the Old Ignatian. Now, they don't have an official sacred text, but they do use the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, the Law of Moses, and they use those books to support their teachings. They do not consider themselves to be Jews in the modern sense, meaning they're not Orthodox Jews, they're not Reformed Jews, they're not conservative Jews. They are the real Jews. Because they believe that black people in America are the real Jews, are the real descendants of the tribe of Judah. What's the problem with this group? Well, first of all, they minimize the person of Jesus. That's the first problem. Uh, by suggesting that you're going to be saved by calling on the Hebrew name of Jesus. Wow. The second problem is they did not trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as we want. The third problem is, again, salvation only in the name of Jesus. The fourth problem is God's only true name is Yahweh. That's the case I'm in trouble. Because I thank God for Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> My provider. Yes. When I'm sick, I need Jehovah Rock for my healing. Yes. When I'm depressed, I need Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Yes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. So if this is true, I'm in trouble. And then they did not have it in hell. Well, that's the case. Why are we here? Why are we here? So, uh, any questions? Um, I don't know, I think I'm part of my time, but um, um, I know I'm dealing, as Pastor said, with Google theologians. Now, what if I can't answer Pastor David Williams? <laughs> if I can't answer, he'll answer. I'm going back to my church. <laughs> he'll answer. Yes, sir, brother. Oh, right. So, my question is this. What's up, family? What's up, man? Right, so, check it out. My question is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was told that God's name is Yahweh, not just Yah. So, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, is that correct? Is Yahweh not just Yah according to what they're saying? Um, Yahweh is one way of saying God's name. There's also Elohim. Uh, there's also Al Shaddai. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, and even, even Yah is a way of saying it, but for example, um, the Rastafarians, they're like your middle brother, the Rastafarians, 
would, would now, I don't think they'll go to the extremists of these black Hebrews and say, it's just Jah. But if you ever talk to us far, they're going to tell you, God is Jah, praise Jah. Which you do see in scripture, you see it in Psalms. It's one of those Psalms God is referred to as Jah. So, there are, that's the problem I have with this black Hebrew ideology. The, the notion that there's just one way to, to, to name God is, is ludicrous. I, I, it's just ludicrous. You know, like I said, when, when I'm sick, I'm calling him Jehovah Rapha. You know, when I'm broke, I'm calling him Jehovah uh, Jireh. So, um, they're using a name of God, but it, they're exploiting also, I just want to say thank you for clarifying what you mentioned about the fact that they believe that we're in a, as you said, a Caucasian heaven. And I know I had a discussion with some men close to my job, and I know they only tend to be the King James version. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all knew King James was. King James was a European himself. I remember some of them, man, how is it you going to. He was a Muslim. Oh, and you going to, that's the only version they, they study. Yes. Like, but you won't preach yes. to those folk, but to some of them, yes. they like the religion of them. Yes. And I'm glad you brought up King James. They will not give me up there. I'm, I'm going to look over here. Um, <laughs> let me say this about King James. King James was not a religious man at all. Was not religious at all. In fact, King James, and you, and you can Google it. I ain't lying. King James was a, was a, was a little watcher for you millennials. That's RuPaul. He was a cross dresser. <laughs> The only reason his name is on your Bible is because he finds he finds the translation into English. Go ahead. So I'm always back when folk come to me talking about they only want to hear from the King James Bible because this is the real Bible. Really? You want to go there with me? <laughs> if you only knew about King James. <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you, I, I generally agree for New King James Version. King, New King James is a much better translation. King James Version, honestly, and don't stop reading, I, it's very poor, I, I, I still read it, but listen, it is not, it's not one of your better translations. Let me just say that. It, it, if you really read it, it it's, it's actually, the most, the most patriarchal, the most misogynistic, the most sexist, the most racist, probably of all translations. And it was designed to be that way because it was King James' way of trying to keep the people uh, under his control. Wow. His subjects. Anybody seen the book of Eli? Yes. Remember, why did the man want to get his hands on the last Bible? Because it was going to help him keep his people subjected to him and under his control. Wow. That's why King James wanted the text translated into Old English. That's why his name is on the Bible. He was not interested in what the Bible said, except for the parts that, that were going to keep the people subjected to him. Thank you. Yes, sir. Why do you think most major seminaries omit uh, the African part of oh, their teaching? Um, unfortunately, it goes back to um, what we talked about earlier. We talked about the Enlightenment. Um, we still, I'm saying we, um, there are persons in Christianity. Who, who, who say Christians who really need to be liberated and vindicated and delivered from white supremacy. And so what happens is when we take, let's say, the history of the of Christian thought or the history of the Christian church, we are taught church history, but we're taught it from strictly from a European perspective. We're not told that Tertullian was an African. We're not told that Augustine was an African. And, and there's an agenda behind that. And it, and it really goes back 
to even what I said earlier about um, when the European nations, particularly the Portuguese, Portuguese came to Africa in the 15th century and told Africans, oh, you are the Negroes. You're not Egyptians, you're not Ethiopians, you're not Kushites, you're not, you're not Alexandrians, you're showing the Alexandrians. You know, because these are, you know, these are the names that are in the Bible. And I don't want you to know your name in the Bible. I don't want you to know that, that Africa is the seedbed of Christianity. So I don't want you to know that. Um, I don't want to offend nobody. But when I say this, all I'm going to teach you is the white boys. And I love Bart. I love Tillich. I love learning. I mean, I can talk that stuff all day. But I also need to know some James Cone. You know, <laughs> I want to talk about some James Cone as well. I want to talk about, I want to talk some Martin Luther King theology. I, you know, I want to talk some Walter Rochelle, who was a European, but who was committed to social justice and the social gospel. So, I, I think that's the problem. There's an agenda. And until we, until certain persons, the powers to be, are delivered from that agenda, that's what's going to happen. And, and, and like we were talking about in the office, the interesting thing is in seminaries now, the majority of your student body and men are minority. But they're not being taught about their, their rich heritage in Christendom. Yes, you did. Uh -huh. Was it translated to 
GNTs, most of the GNTs are the same. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. Oh. 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 Well, see, that's the thing. King James had nothing to do with translations. He just financed it. So he just put money up. Um, the translations were done by, believe it or not, Puritan scribes, when we talk about the King James Version. Um, I would say you have to go back to the original languages. And of course, we know for the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, most of it was written in Hebrew, the original autograph. Most of the New Testament would be written in Greek, though you have some Aramaic, though you have some Arabic. Um, um, and honestly, Jesus would most likely be the Greek derivative of, since the New Testament is written in Greek, it's, 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 it really means actual Joshua means the same thing as you. One who saves. That's what it means. One who saves. And it's interesting if you look at some uh, Hispanic, um, you will find many of them, it looks like Jesus, but it's really Jesus. So what we're dealing with is etymologies are our word derivatives. Uh, that's really what you're dealing with. I don't know if they answer the question or not, but but you deal with language translations. Um, but I don't believe that there was an agenda in Jesus' name um, being in the New Testament. Um, even though we know that some other stuff happened, uh, we wish we won't get into. But but I think I think the name Jesus is pretty solid. Um, but I, it's, I think it's just a matter of language. Language translation. Yes, sir. I wanted to know the Ethiopian Bible. Is mm-hmm. it, where can we buy that? Is it a copy of Excel? That's a good question. I don't. Now that I don't know the answer to. I wish I did. Can someone help me? Amazon. These Google theologians. There you go. And you're right. Amazon got so much of my money, I ought to have some stock in it. <laughs> oh, I got it. Yeah, they got so much of my money. So yeah, I will start with Amazon. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, Lord, she's running the phone. Yeah, Lord, yes. Y'all pray. Pray in the spirit. Terry. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this information. This has been very, very helpful. Praise the Lord. So I would like you to help uh, us with this. Those of us who are Bible teachers, okay. and we have been commissioned by the Holy Spirit okay. to teach truth. Okay. So how do we balance black versus white, Greek versus African, when scriptures has told us there is no longer any Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, free or slave? We're all one mm-hmm. in Christ. Mm-hmm. So how do you really want to de-emphasize so much? You want every, yes, know our history mm-hmm. because that helps us with our identity. Mm-hmm. But we want to take the emphasis off of this black, white, you're African, mm-hmm. one. We're one. And we want to be unified so that we can fight mm-hmm. the real enemy. Mm-hmm. So how do we how do we balance this in our, in our teaching? Because we want to do what scripture say, go out to all the world and yes. fight. Yes. That's what we want to do. Yes. Uh, How do you balance this? Well, Pastor David said something early in his introduction. He talked about uh, Christian being a religion about relationship with Christ, not about ethnicity, not about race. I think that's where we start. I think in our teaching, discernment, the spirit of discernment, you talk about the Holy Spirit being, being commissioned and commissioned. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us discernment. I think that's important. The way we balance it is uh, we almost what some modern day scholars have, 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 have suggested, have argued is that we develop a new Christian race. 
which would consist of everyone you talk about in the body of Christ, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of culture, just a new Christ Christian race. Now, with the challenge with that is this, uh, and it's ideal, it, it's really ideal, it's what you're getting at. The challenge is, when we study scripture, uh, we don't want to study scripture out of context. So the challenge is having that balance you're talking about while also making sure we study scripture in its proper context. So when I teach Genesis and talk about Cush, yes. stop, make sure that we all understand what Cush is, yes. what the word that yes. is. Yes. That's putting it in context. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so, what do you know about the Maccabees? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's an excellent question. The Maccabees, um, the Maccabees, if you ever see a Catholic Bible, uh, the Catholic Bible includes a section called the Apocrypha, um, which is, I forget how many books it is, but it's a section um, that is not included in the Protestant, the 66 books that we consider that are canonical. Canonical meaning they meet our standard for scripture. Um, the Maccabees, I think it's 1st, 2nd Maccabees, uh, I don't know much, but what I do know is that the Maccabees were a Jewish um, group uh, and who had a story, <laughs> you know, just like, you know, most of the stories we read about in the Hebrew Bible. And like I said, I'm not very familiar with it, but it's a part of the Apocrypha. The, the Maccabees, their, their texts are part of the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha are a set of books that are considered apocalyptic in nature, which is why it's called the Apocrypha. And the word apocalyptic means unveiling. Um, there are two books that are considered apocalyptic in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's the book of Daniel. In the New Testament, it is the book of Revelation. There's some other books that have some apocalyptic, some apocalyptic flavor. But those two are the two that we would consider apocalyptic. And, and, and that's why Revelation is called Revelation. It means to reveal something, it means to unveil something, to take off the, the veil of something that has been disclosed from us. But I know that's not a good answer to your question. Uh, but um, it's a good question because, again, we don't know much about the apocalypse because it's not in our world and I don't can of the Bible. But then we talked earlier about the Ethiopian Bible, how it has 81 books, the Apocrypha. Some of those books are also in the Ethiopian Bible. But the problem with scripture is, is this. What we know as the Bible were books that were put together through a process of canonization through councils. Okay, meaning Actually, human beings decided what, what was going to be scripture. I'll give you two examples, and I'm not going over my time, but um, the book of Esther almost didn't make it in the canon. Because if you read the book of Esther, Esther never mentions God. God is very much implied. But the name of God is never mentioned in Esther. The Psalms of Solomon, for obvious reasons, is honeymoon material. Let me say that. <laughs> Almost did not make it in the Bible because it's so erotic in nature if you really know the symbolism. Which, which Pastor David showed right when we were running out here, I told you that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry.